This is joint work, most of it, from the start on. I will say when I get to something that is not joint work, with uh, Gaetan Bourreau and Nicolas Orantin. So they are both students of Bertrand. And uh, geometric recursion clearly takes its sort of origin in topological recursion, but it's quite different from topological recursion. And you will see how. So let me just start by looking at a setup that I would like to consider. So this is a very general setup. So I want to look at a category S, which is compact oriented surfaces. And the morphisms are just isotopy classes of diffeomorphisms. And the target category would be, uh, just be some category of vector spaces. You should uh, think of infinite dimensional vector spaces, most of the applications I have in mind. And then I have a functor given from S to V, so it assigns a vector space to every surface in a functorial way. And moreover, I want a functorial assignment of vectors inside these vector spaces for every surface. And then, of course, since it's a functorial assignment, what will happen is that these vectors here will be in the mapping class group invariant part of these vector spaces. And so you might think this is a very particular situation. But actually, this, there are uh, really a lot of examples that are very naturally of this form in low dimensional geometry and topology. So let me, uh, uh, that's what I say right here. And let me start to give you the first few examples. So the first example, I will simply take E of sigma to be continuous functions on Teichmuller space of the surface. Okay, that's the, that's, the, that's the functor E. And then, of course, I think you will certainly agree with me that if I take the function 1 in every Teichmuller space, then that uh, works. Now, you may think this is an utterly trivial example, but I will get back to this, and it relates very closely to Mia Sakani's work of, of Mia Sakani Machin identities and her work on volumes. Okay, second example more interesting. So let's take S to be the set of multi-curves. So this is the set of isotopy classes of embedded close one manifolds in sigma, such that no component is isotopic to a boundary component, nor are any two of the components isotopic. Okay, so this is first on multi-curves. And now I define a function on Teichmuller space also. And what it does is that it sums through the set of multi-curves you then take the product over the set of components, and then you apply some function which is sufficiently fast decaying function at infinity to the lengths of each of the components, and then you take product or component sum over all um, such multi-curves. So obviously, uh, this is, if the decay is fast enough, this will be an absolute convergent series, and it's a nice continuous function on Teichmuller space, and it is mapping class group invariant exactly because if the decay is fast enough, you can reorder the, uh, the elements here in the set here, and that's all that a mapping class would be doing. Yeah, the is can see the metrics with cusps of these boundary components. Uh, so uh, I will be specific about this in a second. We will actually look at boundaries and have geodesic boundaries. But right now I'm not so specific. I will come back to this example in great detail. Okay, so basically this list here is just to show you that there are lots of things that actually fit into this general scheme that I started uh, uh, considering. So you're going to Yes, yes, I will get to all the details of this in a second. But uh, for now, I just want to motivate with some overall examples. But you will see typically we need some kind of topologies on these vector spaces to make sense of these sums. But okay, let's uh, consider continuous functions again. And now what I take is I take the trace that we saw this morning uh, of f applied to minus the directly Laplace Beltrame differential operator on uh, you know, the Riemann surface for every point in Teichmuller space. So this gives, again, a continuous function, provided f is decaying sufficiently fast. Same thing with something more simple. Suppose you take the Vey Peterson symplectic two form. Well, that's a two form on Teichmuller space. Uh, if you take Bayer's complex structure, that fits in the framework too, because the vector space is then just smooth sections of the endomorphism bundle of the tangent bundle. If you take closed forms on Teichmuller space, of course, this fits in the scheme as well. Uh, you could imagine representing cohomology classes. We know that we have you know, all of these stable, even-dimensional classes, but we also have all the unstable, odd-dimensional classes, and we don't really know how to construct uh, you know, form representatives of these, right? So that could, uh, that's sort of 
just a remark for now. Then, of course, I can consider a different moduli space. I can consider, you know, the moduli space of G flat connections on the surface, where G is, say, some semi simple E group. It could rather be complex or real. And I could then take the fogg rossley poisson structure on the space, so that would be a, sec a section of the second wedge product of the tangent bundle of this moduli space. Mm, uh, you know what? Uh, Rosley is visiting our center, and one of the things he needs to do is present Jana with a copy of his passport. And this is copy from his passport. <laughs> so... <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so uh, the next example is the narrow siemens uh, shishatri complex structure on the moduli space of these flat connections. Now, of course, in order to get a symplectic situation, I have to fix conjugacy classes at all the boundary components, and I require that the holonomia contained in those conjugacy classes. And then uh, I really get a nice, so the, 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 this one is, I think, dying, but uh, uh, you know, I get in this case here a nice vector space, which is now more complicated because it is smooth functions from Teichmuller space to the space in which complex structures live in, namely smooth section of the endomorphism bundle over Teichmuller space. But the, the whole thing is equivariant, right? So it's really a mapping class group invariant element in this thing, this, this Narashima Shishatri family of complex structures. Okay, so along the same vein, <laughs> <laughs> I can <laughs> do... <laughs> no, but it stops at this uh, slide here, but let me just mention them. So there is the Ricci potential in moduli space. There's the hyperkähler structure of Nigel Hitchin on the Higgs bundle moduli spaces. You could even talk about <laughs> representations of mapping class groups. Itself, they, they will just be flat connections in trivial bundles over Teichmuller space. You could also talk about boundary vectors in T of T. They don't quite fit the scheme here, because in this case here, the boundary vectors are only invariant under the diffeomorphism that extends over the three manifold. But, okay, let's mention them anyway. In fact, invariants of both three and four manifolds, smooth four manifolds, can be fitted in the scheme simply by representing three and four manifolds by either Hika diagrams or trisection diagrams. Uh, also, you know, forms that come out of gromov witten theory and amplitudes and closed string theory, as far as you believe that they are top forms on Teichmuller space that are mapping class group invariant. So, tons of it. Okay, let's now be more specific then. So the category I would like to work with is compact oriented surfaces of negative Euler characteristic with a mark point on each boundary component together with an orientation of the boundary in such a way that it splits to in and out and the inclusion of the ins in the surface gives you an isomorphism on pi zeros. It means that there is exactly one in for each connected component and all the rest are out. Okay, and then isotopic classes orientation preserving diffeomorphisms, which preserves the mark points, and the orientations on the boundary, modulo isotopy, which preserves all the structure. Those are the morphisms. So this is the precise category of surfaces we want. Okay, so now uh, let's go to the category of vector spaces that we want. Well, uh, at first go, what we would like to have is Hausdorff complete locally convex topological vector spaces over the complex numbers. So these are vector spaces whose topology is given by seminorms. And then I want for morphisms, I just want morphisms of locally convex topological vector spaces. But uh, we have to go a little bit more complicated than that, unfortunately. And uh, let me just uh, uh, sort of preempt the example of Teichmuller space. So example of continuous functions on Teichmuller spaces. And so the point is that, you know, I'm also going to introduce precisely which Teichmuller space I want in a second. But uh, for now, just think of Teichmuller space of with metrics that are hyperbolic on a surface with boundaries such that the geodesics are so that, such that the boundary are geodesics. Then, of course, inside here, you see, and then I might just so so the, the vector space I just want to consider is the one that we saw before. That's just continuous functions on this Teichmuller space. 
But in order to somehow get the whole analysis to run under the recursion, I have to consider, you know, pick an epsilon and then consider the subspace of Teichmuller space that consists of surfaces with all geode closed simple geodesics of length at least epsilon. So I need those also. And so therefore that epsilon will lie in the real line plus and I will have C0 of these guys. So what happens is now that I don't have just one vector space. I have a system of vector spaces indexed by a directed set. Okay, so that's why I now switch to a saying that an object in my target category is a directed set and an inverse system of such Hausdorff complete locally convex topological vector spaces over this directed set. Epsilon is what? Geodesics of length? So here this means, you know, uh, smallest geodesic bigger than or equal to epsilon. So your initial space is directed limit of, of epsilon. That's right. And therefore you get such in the directed system, so the continuous functions. And now uh, I also want some specific set that indexes the semi-norms. And in this case over here, you should just think of this A epsilon here as, well, a set of compact subsets of this system, I mean, this set of, of systole at least epsilon, right? So then if I take the seminorm, which is max of the uh, pointwise norm over those sets, I will get the appropriate seminorms to get the natural uh, such vector space structure on these two. Okay, so uh, that, that we have here, so we have these projective limits like this, and then of course what I can do, yeah, I can take the projective limit of the whole uh, uh, guy, that's uh, this space here in this case here, and then of course what I can look at is I can look at sort of the subset that has finite norms, where the norms that I'm, uh, it's a semi-norm, where the norm is simply the supremum over all compact subsets. So this subspace prime here just means functions that are bounded on all the systole sets. These are epsilon systole sets, right? So these semi-norms here, this guy, I did, unfortunately this doesn't really work, oh, that guy, uh, you know, that's the max norm over that subset. So all, not all the continuous function, of course, has finite norm for that, obviously. It's only the bounded ones. Okay. And then morphisms is completely naturally defined. The morphism of such two objects, you know, is an inverse system of uh, continuous linear maps, phi i j, where i is running through the first index set and j runs in the second one, but it is less than h of i, where h of i is some order preserving map from one to the other. And this should, of course, induce continuous maps of the limits in such a way that these prime spaces are mapped to each other. Okay, very good. So I assume, I assume that I've, uh, I'm given, you know, a functor from this category of surfaces that I introduced to this category C here. So such a, such a C I call, a, you know, a target theory. It will have to satisfy a few more things in a second. But anyway, the whole idea is try to recursively define a vector inside the E prime guy of the surface mapping class group invariant part. And we want to do this recursing in the Euler characteristic. And the basic idea is to remove a pair of pants from the surface. And this will increase the Euler characteristic by one. I'm only considering negative Euler characteristic surfaces. So it will end with Euler characteristic minus one, which is either a pair of pants or one whole torus. And so over on the side here, I try to indicate the three different types of pair pants embeddings you can imagine. Namely, uh, one is where there are two boundaries in common with the surface of the pair pants, and the other two, so, so that's the B case, and the other two is the C case. And the C case, you only have one boundary in common, and the two other boundaries are inside the surface. Okay, now, this requires me to have further data given because this means that, you know, if I want to define something for a disjoint union, I would like to have a bilinear map, a morphism here from the, from the cross product two vector spaces for the two uh, individual components over to the disjoint union. 
And also, if I have gluing maps, you know, if I have two surfaces and if I have a pair of boundaries that I want to glue on, I need to have gluing maps. Because then I can somehow, you know, cut out this piece here each time and I can stick in some starting data, say A for a pair of pants, mapping class group invariant, part of that, and D, uh, some guy for the one whole torus, also mapping class group invariant, part of that. And so I will start by defining these two to be that initial data. And then I need recursion kernels, so these are just elements also in the vector space for a pair of pants, both B and C. And B, well, B depends on a, a choice of one of the boundaries on the pair of pants that namely goes to the other one, right? Suppose the, here this is the minus boundary, then the pair of pants has to have its minus boundary go here, but then the pair of pants has two out boundaries, and I can decide whether it's one or the other that goes <coughs> to this boundary here. So therefore, I have two copies of B, okay? All right, and then the idea is simply, I just sum over all possible ways of extracting pair of pants of the two kinds of types. I stick in the recursion kernel in the first slot and I use the morphism for gluing, and I recursively assume that I have defined a thing for what remains after I extract a pair of pants, and I sum like this. Now, of course, this has problems because these two sets here of isotopy classes of embedding, embedded pair of pants these are, of course, infinite. I mean, they're countable, but they are infinite sets. So therefore, I will have to do some kind of analysis in order to understand what this sum means. Now, if it could actually be quite interesting to maybe just do some kind of divergent series here where you just assume that these terms here are bounded by something for each extraction, and then you would get a divergent series and you'd have to work on this sort of the way that we are having the main theme of this conference. But what we will do at first is actually somehow specify conditions on these gluing maps and the initial data in such a way that these sums here will be absolutely convergent. Okay, so let me now describe what we need in order to make sense of these if we want them to really be convergent series. And so in order to make them... Yeah. It's not your, that you're summing over an infinite set. Yes, I am. An ordered infinite set. No yes, that's right. And therefore, we better make sure that the series are absolutely convergent, so it doesn't matter which ordering we choose. Right? Yeah. I agree. Okay. So now what we're going to do is actually give the precise definition of what I mean by a C-valued target theory. So this will be a functor E from S to the category C we have previously defined, these directed sets of, of uh, vector spaces with all these seminorms on. So that's what I'm saying here. So I have the vector space for every surface and I have all the set of seminorms indexed by, in this, in this case here, it was all the compact subsets of the system sets in this example, right? But right now I'm just thinking abstractly, there are just some abstract given set of seminorms. And what now, but now I take again inspiration from this example here. So if I have a compact subset of Teichmuller space, and I have a, gi a given curve on the surface, what of course I can do is I can talk about the length of this curve, because I can just take the minimum of its geodesic length over this compact subset. So we see that l there is a natural way that what parameterizes the seminorms in this example also parameterizes length functions. And so therefore I'm simply just going to say abstractly, well I just want abstractly length functions which are defined on the set of multicurves on the surface. They take value in non-zero complex numbers and they are exactly indexed by the indexing set for the seminorms. So that is just a natural abstraction out of what I see in the Teichmuller case. Okay. Now, I need that these length functions satisfy three different actions for this theory to work. And the first one is polynomial growth action. And so what you do is you say, let's take an i and let's take uh, some semi-norm. And what I do is I also take a large l. And then I look at all the multi-curves that has length less than L for that set of seminorm, for that seminorm, sorry. So this is a finite, so what, I, what we need to assume is that this is a finite uh, set and 
it sh its size should not grow more than polynomial in, in the length L. So that means there should exist mi and di such that this guy here, when I take supremum over all uh, 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 the, you know, the things that index the seminorms for the i uh, subspace, should be bounded by this. And so in the Teichmuller case, this is simply just uh, a result of Ravine that says that on a systole set, the number of geodesics of length uh, less than epsilon, sorry, le length than L, sorry, and it's simple geodesics, I'm talking about simple closed geodesics, grow at most like a polynomial. I think this di here is 16 minus 6 plus 2n or something like this is the best co uh, constant you can choose in that case. But we just assume abstractly that there is this property here for our length. Okay, then there is a lower bound, and that is directly from the systol uh, definition here. We strapped this out. So it says that for any i, there should exist an epsilon i bigger than zero, such that the infimum of the lengths over the set here of all the seminorms and all the simple closed curves on the surface should be le bigger than epsilon i. Uh, sorry, epsilon i. So that's just the analog of saying that I have picked systol sets. Okay, and then there is the small pair of pants axiom, and it simply says that for each i, there should be some constant such that if I look at all the seminorm guys, and I look at the length, and I look at all pair of pants embedded in the surface, for which the length of the interior boundary of the embedding is smaller than the length of the boundary that's common with sigma, then this should be a finite set and bounded by QI. So that this is satisfied for Teichmuller spaces follows by some work of uh, Hugo Pallier. Okay, so those are the three things I would like to have. Polynomial growth action, I would like a lower bound action and a small pair of pants action. Okay, so now I specify the gluing data. So again, I want this uh, you know, uh, way to take disjoint unions, so a linear map here that, that uh, is, you know, satisfies nice associativity when you do Cartesian products and associativity of unions on this side. I would also like to have gluing maps like this when I have pairs uh, from the two boundaries uh, from the out of this and in here, and then I uh, make the gluing and so I'd like to have linear maps from the vector space of these two to the glued thing. And of course, this should be compatible with gluing morphisms and with associativity of gluings and with disjoint unions. So this is exactly what I said before here that I was in need of in order to make sense of this. Okay. So, very good. So now, what is the initial data that I have to start with? Well, as we discussed before, I certainly need the thing for a pair of pants, but I also need the recursion kernel uh, the C1 and BB, I need also in a pair of pants where B is one of the outboundaries of P. And of course, if I have a diffeomorphism that interchanges the two outboundaries, then I must have this condition here on B. And then D, and I want to assume that D is a separate guy. I could assume always that C was some kind of trace of D because for one whole torus, I could just sum over all possible ways of breaking it into a pair of pants. But that would put some, gate, some trace class conditions on C that we don't want necessarily to have in all our examples. So I just allow D to be a separate part of the initial data. Okay, and here is the precise analytic properties, the decay action that we want for the initial data combined with the gluing maps. So it says that if you take two guys from the indexing set of the pair of pants and the complement of the pair of pants for some embedding of a pair of pants inside sigma. And now you take a k that is less than this map that you get from the directed sets uh, to by the gluing morphism. And then you take you know, any seminorm in the glued surface. Then you require that there must exist an sk that is bigger than this dk that went into the growth rate and functorial constants that depends on these indices i, j, and k, such that if you take and look at the gluing morphism applied to B and any vector in uh, um, the, 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 the complement of the pair of pants, so that's called, uh, where is it? It's called sigma complement, I get there, 
here. So any vector v that lies in the E prime space mapping classical invariant part, you must have that this norm here is less than this constant times the norm of v times this one plus, and then you know you take the length of the boundary in the interior and you subtract the length uh, from the stuff that's common with the boundary, and then you add one and you take the plus part of that. And the plus part just means you know, if it's negative, it's zero, but if it's positive, it's just equal to the identity. So you only look at the things that, you know, give you positive quantities for this quantity here. So only the pair of pants for which the length of the boundary is smaller than the interior length. And that's typically what's going to happen. That's most of them. In fact, all of them, except for finitely many by our small pair of pants action. And then you lift, you require that this lifted to minus SK uh, bounds this quantity here. And the same thing for C. So this is the precise analytic condition that we require on this initial data, and I'll give you several examples in a second that satisfies this. Okay, so now we start the recursion. So uh, for an empty surface, we may want to define this to be just one. For a pair of pants and a one-hole torus, we are bound to define this as A and D. And now we just use this formula here to define it for any surface of Euler characteristic uh, less than or equal to minus 2. And for connect, this is for connected surfaces, and for disconnected surfaces, we just multiply them together <coughs> via this uh, you know, disjoint union morphism. And so the, 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 the main theorem of this says that this assignment is well defined. And so more precisely, actually, this series here is absolutely convergent for any of the seminorm and its limit lies in the E prime guy, and it is functorial. In particular, the, this, this state that we get out of it here it lies in the E prime guy, and it is mapping class group invariant. <laughs> okay. So, um, let me just say a little bit about how the proof goes. So, you just, for example, take, take this part of the sum here. And because we want to show absolute convergence, I just take the norm of everything inside the sum. And now if I just look at... Um, so obviously, if I just take my estimates that I have for the, for, for the initial data, so I just go back here and show you, just use this estimate here, straight off. So if I use this estimate, what I get is that this side here is bounded by this quantity here, where this zeta function here uh, is simply just the sum of all the pair of pants, and then you take this quantity here. And now the axioms are exactly set up such that polynomial growth axiom plus plus small pair of pants axiom will guarantee that there exists an SK bigger than DK such that this is finite. And then the lower bound action plus the small pair of pants action will actually say that there exists a constant such that this gadget here when you're taking supremum over all the seminorms is universally bounded. Okay, and when you so therefore what you're going to get is this 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 quantity here. So that shows that this series here is absolutely convergent and lies in this set here. And then you have to work a little harder to say that the whole thing lies in E prime. But I, I don't want to go through all the details of the proof. Okay, so in other words, uh, you know you can really make sense of these sums here this way here. Okay, let's go through the example of Teichmuller theory and let me introduce precisely which Teichmuller space I want. So, uh, I take, uh, you know, remember that the, the, the objects I have in this category of surfaces, they are surfaces where each boundary component has a mark point. Uh, so I denote those uh, OB here. And now the Teichmuller space of this guy is simply just the usual way of defining Teichmuller space. You define it to be diffeomorphisms from the surface to a Riemann surface, where this is now a bordered Riemann surface, modulo an equivalence relation. And such two guys here are equivalent if there exists a biholomorphism from the first Riemann surface to the second, such that when you do this composition here around, this first of all restricts to the identity on the mark points, and it is isotopic to the identity on the surface via diffeomorphisms, which restricts the identity on these mark points. So it doesn't change these mark points. So it isn't quite the usual Teichmuller space. The usual Teichmuller space, you wouldn't have the mark points, right? But the thing is that, of course, you can just forget that you have the mark points. So there is a projection from this Teichmuller space here to the usual Teichmuller space of bordered surfaces. And this guy here is simply an R to the number of boundary components bundled over this. Because when I do the twist around the boundary, 
you know, I can keep doing it. And even if I do a two pi around, I don't come back to the same metric because it's twisted, right? Okay. Now, of course, I have the group uh, delta sigma, which is all the boundary parallel Dehn twists, they act freely on this guy here. And if I divide out that subgroup here of the mapping class group acting on this Teichmuller space, uh, there should have been a P here. It's this guy here. Then, of course, this just drops down to be a circle bundle over, I mean, a torus bundle over this guy where the torus is this U1 to the number of boundary components. And I need exactly this guy here because I want to integrate over these fibers here in a second when I do the gluing morphism. Okay, so, uh, you know, if we look at a pair of pants, what do we have? Well, the usual Teichmuller space just says that it's R plus to the three. Just think of representing by hyperbolic metrics. The boundary components are geodesics. So therefore, you just have the three lengths of the boundary components for a pair of pants. That gives you the usual Teichmuller space. It specifies points uniquely there. And the point is that with these guys here, you just add a copy of R for each of the boundary components. And if you divide by these Dehn twists that are parallel to the boundary, you just have R plus cross U1 to the 3. And then we can, of course, imagine having coordinates. So these are the lengths and these are the twist parameters on this Teichmuller space here. OK. So, in, uh, you know, in a second, I'll give you initial data. And this means I just give you functions that are defined here on these six variables. In fact, most of the time, I'll just give you one that is defined here. And then I just pull it back via this projection that forgot about the mark points. OK, so now let's discuss how are we going to do the gluing maps. And so let's take two guys and let's uh, take some pairs of boundary components we're going to glue on. Then, of course, what I can look at is I can look at the subset of the Teichmuller space of the disjoint union, where I just look at the subset where the lengths of the boundaries that I'm going to glue on agree. So I'm ready to glue, right? Uh, so that's the subset of, of, the, of the Teichmuller space of disjoint union. And now I can just glue, so I get a map from here to the, to, the glue, to the glued surface just by gluing the hyperbolic matrix. I can do that if the lengths and the boundaries agree that I glue on. And the point is that this will give, realize this, this space here where I divide by, you know, if you take the, if you, take the de, if you have such a curve that you're gluing on, if you do a Dehn twist on one side and the inverse Dehn twist on the other side, th before gluing this really matters, but after gluing it doesn't because the two are, are, of course, isotopic to identity after you're glued. So therefore, you can divide that group action out. It won't change the image over here. And then the point is that the, what you're left with is, again, just a circle, a torus bundle over this guy here. A copy of the circle for every boundary component, a pair of boundary components you glue on. OK, so now let's uh, introduce these subsets. So, sorry, uh, what I called here T epsilon sigma is actually called K sigma epsilon here. So, it is just the subset for which the systole, so the length of the shortest geodesic on the surface, is bigger than epsilon. I take indeed just uh, continuous functions on that. And then, of course, as we just discussed over here, we have a family of semi norms by just uh, thinking of compact subset here. That gives me this uh, locally convex Hausdorff complete topological vector space structure on these. And of course, if epsilon is smaller than epsilon prime, I get restriction maps that go this way here. So I have a system. I have a directed system, as I said I would like to have. And now uh, the vector space, the total vector space we're considering is, of course, this continuous function of all the Teichmuller space. We look at this, n these norms here. They are just supremum norms over the systole sets. And so these guys here are just functions that are bounded on the system sets. OK. Um, yeah, then we define a length function. And this length function is just take the minimum of the length of uh, a given curve over the compact subset. Now, this is actually commensurable to uh, if you just took one point of this compact subset, because there actually exists a, co a constant between 0 and 1 such that you know, this length here bounds CK times the length of the, all of the elements in the compact subset. OK. Now, so because this guy here is exactly s defined in such a way that it is systole sets, of course, it satisfies the lower bound action. And then, as I sort of promised in the beginning here, or mentioned here in the beginning, right, there is a result of Ravine, which actually was refined by Miyazakani. But, but I think the way we just use it here is just the stuff that was done by Ravine that says that you know, if you have a, a simple closed curve on the surface or a multi-curve, then if you look at the ones that have uh, growth 
uh, that have lengths less than L, then this here will grow slower than the power of L when L goes to infinity. So the polynomial growth axiom is also okay, and there is this work of Hugo Parlier we could use to show that the small pair of pants axiom is also okay. Very good. And so now I have to give you precisely what is the gluing morphism. Well, for disjoint units, it's totally trivial, because the Teichmuller space of a disjoint unit is just a cross product. So you have a projection qi to each of the factors, and you just pull back with respect to the qi's, and you take the product. That's the, that's the disjoint morphism, disjoint union morphism. Now, the gluing morphism is similarly simple. What you do is first you take the disjoint union, so you get Teichmuller space of the disjoint union. Then you look at this inclusion map, which is just the things where you say the ones that I want to glue on has to have the same length. That's a sub-variety, so you just look at the inclusion of that, and you pull back the functions to there. And now you are on the circle vibration, or sorry, I keep saying circle vibration, I mean torus vibration, because you might glue on more boundary components than one. And so you have this torus vibration, and so you simply just integrate with respect to you know, the rotation invariant measure on each of the fibers of this map. So that's the gluing morphisms. Everything is very explicit and simple. So initial data means that I have to give you two functions, a and c, of these six variables, which are symmetric in the last two variables. I have to give you two b's, depending on which of the two output boundaries of the pair of pants I select to be special. And so they are just completely you know, general functions. There are no symmetry of those. However, they are related to each other. Namely, if I permute the last two coordinates, I go from one to the other. And then I must specify a continuous function that is mapping class group invariant on Teichmuller space of, this, of the, of the one-hole torus. And now the admissibility of the initial data simply becomes very simple in this case here. It just says that for all s and epsilon bigger than zero, there must be, uh, exist a constant that depends on these two, such that if you take the supremum over the systole set of one plus this positive part of the interior length minus the exterior length, and you take that times the function for, for the recursion kernel b, this must be bounded by this constant and correspondingly for c. Okay. That is A, B, C, D, girls, except any constraints. No, they're completely free. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah. But that's because I have a, a, a singled out in boundary and all the rest out. Mm -hmm. If I want to have it, the result completely symmetric in all, I must satisfy relations. But uh, I, because the th free theory is easier to talk about, I somehow, I could talk about that and we know what the relations are in this language here. Okay. But uh, I'd rather give you some examples. So, uh, let's consider the following. So we call this the Miyazakani McShane initial data. And so what you do is you take A to be the constant function 1, and then B and C are given by these very explicit expressions you see here. And then D is just obtained by taking the, what I would call the partial trace. You just sum C over, you know, here you insert the length of the boundary of the torus, and here you insert the length of, the, of a simple closed curve in interior that cuts the thing into a pair of pants, and then you sum over all such. And so when you do this, then the theorem says that uh, for any uh, surface, the geometric recursion applied to this initial data here with this target space continuous functions will give you the function 1. So, uh, you know, you should think of this as a kind of partition of unity, okay? And, you know, the, the, I would say the proof of this is completely straightforward, except for the one fact that, namely Miyazakani's generalization of the McShane identity. And, of course, this is why we pick these two functions. They are taken directly from formally from Miyazakani's uh, generalization of the McShane identity. So the proof is simply just you iteratively, each time you apply the recursion, you prove that this is the case via her identity. Okay. But the nice thing about this is that this has ramifications. Well, sorry, uh, the, 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 you will see the ramifications in a second. I just want to introduce another set of initial data, and this is uh, initial data we call the Konsevich initial data. And so A is again the constant function 1. Now B is this gadget here. So remember the plus is just the positive part, right? So you just take these very simple expressions here, and for C you take this. And for D, you take the sum here. 
And so the theorem now says that you can run the geometric recursion for these, and then you will get some functions on a Teichmuller space, which are mapping class group invariants. Of course, they're continuous functions on the moduli space. And in fact, they are integrable with respect to the volume form that there is associated to the Vapidan symplectic form. And if you perform these integrals here, what you get is exactly just these evaluations here of psi classes. And so this is the reason why we call it the Kontevich initial data. And so, didn't you didn't consider that, no? <laughs> 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 so that's the same with this. Um, yes, Akani and McShane didn't consider this either. But, uh, it is, uh, you, you did consider this, I think. Yeah. Okay, so, <laughs> all right, so now um, I want to generalize these data. So uh, what I do is I look at a continuous function defined under positive reals, uh, and it's going to have sufficient fast decay at infinity, we'll get to that. But my aim is to say I want to make this sum over simple closed uh, I mean, curves, I keep saying that, but it's really multi-curves, right? Sum over multi-curves, and then this product of f applied to the length. And so if you define SF to be the sort of uh, fastest, I mean, the, the polynomial decay rate of the function, so you assume that this guy here is finite, or actually, sorry, you, sh you just define it this way here. But if you know that you have a surface for which 6g minus 6 plus 2n, which is this growth of lengths of geodesics that are simple and closed, is less than SF, then this function here will be an absolute convergence series which defines a continuous function on this type of space. Okay, and now for, so therefore, for example, if you assume that SF is uh, infinity, then this works for all surfaces. And one example of that is that if you just take F to be sort of exponential decaying, then of course it's fine. So for disconnected surfaces, I just simply define the function for the disconnected surface to be the product of the two components. And I, for a pair of pants, of course, we observe that this function is one because the only entry in this sum here is the empty multi-curve. Because I don't allow anything to be isotopic to the boundary, right? Okay. So now the thing is that we can just do this very simple thing of F-twisting initial data. We take the Miyazakani initial data, but now we do this kind of twisting. So for B, we simply just add F of L and for C, we take C of Miyazakani and then we combine B with F this way here, because it has to be symmetric in the last two, right? So you kind of led to this if you want to combine it with F and B. And then you take the product in the end here. And so you take AF to be 1 and you take DF to be 1 plus the result of summing over the uh, simple closed curves on the torus. And so the theorem, which is, uh, uh, you know, less trivial, uh, is that when you apply the geometric recursion to this initial data here, you get exactly this function here. So this is where geometric recursion is sort of very different from some kind of topological field theory or something like this, because if you took this function here on a surface and you cut along one specific curve, then this function will satisfy terrible, complicated gluing rules, because you would want to try to have geodesics match up with directions along the curve you cut along and so on, and it's very complicated. I don't know how to do that, in fact. But this geometric recursion, it satisfies very nicely. And the idea of the proof is somehow that when you have this large sum, you can always fit a pair of pants inside the complement of these curves. And since you're summing over everything, this is going to work out. So there was a very, very rough sketch of that proof, but uh, that's the idea that makes it work. Okay, now, Let's uh, suppose we have some mapping class group invariant functions on Teichmuller space, and let's further assume that they are integrable when we multiply them onto the Ray Peterson volume form. So I'm going to use this notation bracket phi for the integral over the moduli space where I fix the length L1 up to Ln, which I therefore have as, as inputs to the function on this side here. And then if you apply this to this function here, I mean, it turns out that if f, for example, have exponential fast decay, then it automatically follows that the function here is integrable with respect to the Ray Peterson volume form, and the result will satisfy this very simple recursion here. So you see that this recursion here only involves the initial data that you started with, b and c, twisted with f, of course, but then it's just integrations over r plus and r2 plus. 
And of course, this formula here should remind you a lot of what Bertrand just talked about, topological recursion. Except that he didn't write down what the recursion is. <laughs> so <laughs> but I did it here. And uh, in fact, uh, I think my next slide, yes, indeed, is that uh, if you look at this topological recursion, and so this topological recursion takes, as Bertrand was explaining to us, a uh, spectral curve and a one form and a two form, and then you can produce out of this these forms that are indexed by G and N. And the point about how it's related to uh, you know, geometric recursion is the following. That if you start with any spectral curve, which is ready to be applied, uh, you're ready to apply topological recursion to, then you look at uh, the set of ramification points for X, and you consider the sort of standard set of coordinates around each of the ramification points. Now you take V to be the free C vector space on the ramification points. Then we're saying there exists a family of admissible initial data parameterized by a parameter beta in R plus for geometric recursion, with the target theory being continuous functions on Teichmuller space with values in V tensor power, the number of components of the boundary of the surface. So you can compute the GR amplitudes, we call these vectors amplitudes. They become integrable over the moduli space <coughs> of, uh, of the, the guys where you fix the length of the boundaries with respect to the usual Ray Peterson volume form. And then what you should do is you take these averages of the guy you constructed via geometric recursion here. Then you do the uh, 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 inverse Laplace transform in uh, all the variables, you end up with CIs, set i, sorry, and the set i's are exactly the coordinates here. So you take the amplitudes from topological recursion that is you know, computed, and you take these iterated residues like this, and you get that. <coughs> minus central charge? Uh, C beta. beta. Yeah. So some, yeah, yeah, okay. It's uh, in, in conform field theory, I think, might be right. So, um, yeah, so this links up topological recursion with geometric recursion. In fact, it's saying every time you can do something with topological recursion, you can lift this to geometric recursion, you can compute amplitudes in geometric recursion, and modulo this Laplace transform, this is the same thing as output. Okay, now uh, there is a sort of more general thing that you can do, <laughs> namely uh, any time you have initial data for geometric recursion where these constants that, uh, that I showed you for the initial data, if they are independent of epsilon, then the output of geometric recursion will be integrable over the moduli space with fixed lengths with respect to the Ray Peterson uh, volume form. And if you define the WGNs of else to be the average of these guys, then this will satisfy this recursion here. Okay, so for example, if we go back, this is exactly what you saw for these functions here. And so by the way, this sort of allows you to tell, for, uh, answer questions like, if you ask, uh, so, so I have formulated this for continuous functions, but there is an analog of this for measurable functions. So for example, if you take F, to be the function that is constant 1 in the interval, for, say, from 1 to 2, and 0 otherwise, then this certainly has fast decay and infinity. And if you compute this, what you will be getting for these brackets here is the uh, volume of the moduli space for which the surface has a geodesic between 1 and 2. So answering questions about such statistics of lengths of, of, of simple closed curves, I think, was open, and we give this sort of nifty recursion here, namely that these satisfy topological recursion. Okay, and so th that's a very general thing, as this, this guy here says. Th this happens for all geometric recursion you can do, provided you uh, know that they are integrable over the moduli space. Okay, uh, it is not only about functions, so let me give you an example where we study forms. So recall that we had this Teichmuller space for a pair of pants was this guy here. So I have six coordinates, and of course, if I take a torus, I also have French and Nielsen coordinates 
on the on that. Well, I have to choose a curve to do it with respect to, right? But then I get coordinates like this. This is for the boundary and this is the interior stuff. And now I take the target theory, just all forms on Teichmuller space. And I take A to be the exponentiation of this form here. So what I would like to call the Ray, the, the, the Ray Peterson symplectic form for this Teichmuller space. And B, you just multiply Miyazakani initial data onto this guy here. And C, you just multiply Miyazakani initial data onto this guy here. D, you take X of the Ray Peterson symplectic form. And then the theorem says that when you run the recursion for these guys here, you get indeed exponential of the Ray Peterson symplectic form on all surfaces. So that's, a f that's an example where you're using forms and not just continuous functions. Okay, now we can also work uh, on, on measure of each volume. So this is some uh, rather recent uh, uh, results to, uh, with uh, these gentlemen here. Uh, and and uh, you know, we've just put a paper on the archive uh, a couple of weeks ago. And so now you consider the bundle of quadratic differentials over Teichmuller space. Of course, this guy has a natural norm, which is just take Q wedge Q bar and take a square root of the absolute value of that, integrated over sigma. Um, there should have been that sigma there, but uh, okay. And so there are, of course, local holonomy coordinates on the space of quadratic differentials. And so therefore that gives you a notion of lattice points and there is the measure of each measure on the space of quadratic differentials which is simply obtained by counting lattice points. And so we normalize it in such a way that the co-volume of the lattice is one. And then that allows you to define a measure on the unit uh, sphere bundle of this cotangent bundle of moduli space, namely if, if y is a measurable set inside the unit norm correct differentials here, you simply just defined its measure to be, well, 12g minus 12 plus 4n times, and then the measure of each volume of the cone on it, of this size here. And so this is a mapping class group invariant measure, and it's a result of measure and weeds that actually the whole bundle here over moduli space has finite volume. And so uh, it's an interesting thing to actually try to compute these measure of each volumes. Okay, so uh, we do the following. Uh, take this function here, and now take that function and twist the Kontsevich initial data with this f. And then you, what comes out, we will call the measure of each uh, uh, amplitudes. They're continuous functions on Teichmuller space, which are, of course, mapping class group invariant. And then we can, they actually also satisfy that it becomes an integral function over the moduli space. And so we average this function with respect to the Ray Peterson form again over this moduli space, and it becomes a function just of the length of the boundaries. And our theorem says that this is a polynomial in the LIs, actually. And this polynomial is related to the measure of each volumes via this explicit thing here. So its zero order coefficient is simply just modulo these quantities here, the measure of each volume. So, in other words, uh, you know, you can construct this function via geometric recursion and then when you integrate it, you get this. And so, since you always have recursion when you integrate, so one of the tools that geometric recursion can be used for is to show that something is satisfying topological recursion. Because we have this theorem that says that if you can find some fun function that satisfies geometric recursion, its average will satisfy topological. Uh, should we have at least one uh, I come to that in a second. So far, n is bigger than 1 here, or equal to. But I come to that uh, on the next slide, not this one. But actually, uh, so if you run through the recursion, what does the recursion actually say in this case here? Well, if you look at this guy here, it was a polynomial. In fact, here is exactly how it is a polynomial, and here are the coefficients. And so we can write down a recursion that just involves the coefficients. So you start out by setting these to be zero, you put this to be this delta function, and then f11 one one is this guy here with this c of two, and then you have this recursion relation here with the b's and the c's, and the b's and the c's are given explicitly like this, where you see even c's going in in linear and quadratic way. So, to answer your question, if the surface of genus G and uh, at least some boundaries 
the measure of each volume is given. So this, this is what I just said before. But it turns out actually that if you have a closed surface of genus at least two, then you can actually get the measure of each with no mark points by this coefficient here. So you put L is equal to one and you look at one puncture and you're correct with this factor. So this means that you know, we can very quickly you know, compute it via topological recursion, or if you like, just using this recursion relation here, we can give you all these polynomials that can be put on a computer and spit out as high G and N you want. Okay, so, so far, uh, all my collaborators have been on board with this, and, uh, and so, uh, uh, this, so far I've just given you uh, things we, we, we really have rough results. And if you now allow me to speculate a little bit, then the next stuff will not... Uh, so if you, if you have complaints about this and if you have some, I'd like to hear it. But don't blame my co-authors <laughs> for it, please. Okay. So uh, I just want to try to make some speculations about uh, closed string field theory. So in closed string field theory, you have a, a vertex Hilbert space, which comes from conformal field theory, right? And you have an inner product on it. And the whole key about this is that this theory provides you with brackets, which is indexed by G and N, and some positive real epsilon, which are you know, multilinear brackets from V to the N to V. And all these brackets should satisfy uh, the quantum master equation. Now, I'm not going to write down what a quantum master equation is, but uh, just tell you that I can, you know, I can turn, of course, I can use the inner product up here to turn these brackets into brackets like this, if I like. So now they're just complex valued and they're just equivalent to these brackets here via this inner product like that. I just dualize the first variable. And then the whole uh, sort of expectation or the thing that you, or the definition of whatever you want, is that these multilinear pairings are determined by integrating certain top forms over some subsets of moduli space MGN. Not bar here, but some subset inside the open part of the moduli space. And this subsets here, together with the natural properties that these forms satisfy when they come from conformal field theory, is you know, the quantum master equations for these guys here is equivalent to that these subsets of moduli spaces satisfies this here under, of course, natural identification of the forms under such gluing. So you're supposed to find some subsets somehow, such that the boundary of these subsets for Gn is obtained this recursive way here, which reminds us a lot about what we've just seen, and certainly a lot about topological recursion, because these are exactly the terms in topological recursion. Okay, so uh, what I claim is that we can actually generate a function that, ha that is a characteristic function uh, a, on the moduli space for a set that satisfies this analog of the quantum master equation here. And so it's very, very simple. You just take the following function from uh, R plus to R. It's a measurable function. It is T in the interval from zero to epsilon, and it is zero otherwise. And I require that epsilon has to be less than arc into one. Now I take initial data, which is just a uh, a, B, C, D coupled to these functions here, and it is there should have been mere Sakani McShane coupled to these Fs here. Okay, and now if you, um, for each point in Teichmuller space, define n epsilon sigma p to be the number of simple closed geodesics of length shorter than epsilon, then theorem, and so that one, that part is okay, that's easy to check actually, that if you compute the amplitudes in geometric recursion, for this function here, coupled to the Miyazakani McShane initial data, you will exactly get 1 plus t to this power here. And so, in other words, if I take t to be minus 1, the result will exactly be the indicator function of some subset. And what is this subset? Well, this subset is simply just the systal set. It's just the subset of moduli space for which the, you know, the, all the simple closed interior geodesics have length at least epsilon. And so if you analyze this function here and look at its derivative in a distributional sense, you will exactly see that it's bound these sets here. If you take this set here and hit it with require that all the boundaries also have length epsilon, then these sets here exactly satisfy the quantum master equation. 
So uh, that of course tells you, sorry, that tells you that if you want to do this integral here, you just take and multiply this guy onto these forms and integrate over the whole space. And so therefore I think it's very likely that one should further be able to build the whole form here via geometric recursion, because these forms here satisfy what you expect from you know, conformal field theory, they satisfy factorizations. And that is sort of how we proved that you know, the function times the Ray Peterson symplectic form, because the Ray Peterson symplectic form satisfy natural factorization rules, you know, we know that, that, that we can do the integrations and we get topological recursion. So I really expect that these brackets here will satisfy topological recursion, proved via geometric recursion construction of this. Okay, that would mean that we can compute them, right? So then we should be able to compute these and we have a recursion relation on these and so on. So uh, people who know something about string field theory should uh, please uh, tell me about what's, what examples needs to be done here because I think this, this could be doable. Okay, another example which I think one should really look at is uh, Calabi-Yau manifolds. So you should take uh, M to be the moduli space of complex structures on the Calabi-Yau. You take the standard line bundle that this guy uh, has gotten by taking the three zero part of the homology. And then you're supposed to have these FGs, which are the genus G topological string amplitudes, which are supposed to satisfy the BCOV holomorphic anomaly equations like this. You should take the mirror and then there should be holomorphic sections of these line bundles, which are the genus G chrome of Witten potentials of the, of the mirror. And then the mirror symmetry states somehow that you know, FGs can be obtained from some kind of large complex structure limit of the curly FGs. And so this has been understood in genus zero, but certainly not in higher genus as far as I understand in general. Yeah, huh? yeah, yeah, yes. And so what I would like to understand is, uh, can we expect that these FGNs, uh, these FGs here can be given by geometric recursion? So I'm trying to work on this, but uh, for now it's only just an expectation. But of course then we can go on and say, well, Witten really had this uh, very nice intriguing interpretation of the BCOV equations, right? What he did was he considered this set here, which we also saw in Bertrand's talk a lot. And the thing is that then this set here satisfies in this case here the heat equation. And so, of course, if you just continue following this analog, the heat equation is really a special case of parallel transport equation with respect to the Hitchin connection, where you have states in some uh, spaces of holomorphic sections parameterized by some space T, which is parameterized in complex structure on some pre-quantizable symplectic manifold compact uh, with a line bundle over it. And so I would say that one should expect that this parallel transport problem here can be solved in this form here again, where these FGs here should maybe be constructible via geometric recursion. Maybe one should uh, at first go restrict to the case where this M here is the moduli space of flat SUN connections on the surface. So I don't know, but uh, I would like to discuss this with people if they're interested. I can say the following, uh, or let me be more precise if you like. Oops, sorry. Take uh, X to be a compact oriented three manifold with boundary sigma. Consider the moduli space of flat SUN connections on sigma. Take the Chern Simons line bundle. Take the complement of the zero section of the dual line bundle. Then you can embed all the sections of L to the K in one and the same space, namely functions on that total space that transforms in the kth guy for the kth power. Therefore, in that space, it actually makes sense to sort of consider the total quantum Chern Simon state series like this, which is now a holomorphic function on the total space of this line bundle here. Of course, all of it parameterized by Teichmuller space. And so the conjecture would say that the total state series are resurgent and it has its singularities contained in the set of exponentiated turn Simons values and the zero section inside the pullback of this line bundle to the SLNC moduli space via the cotangent vibration using non-abelian Hodge. And then you should look at moduli space of flat SLN connections on X and compute their Chern Simons values. And so this is, should be where this guy has its singularities. So I think tomorrow we will see maybe an analog of this in the case where the surface is empty, namely for compact manifolds that Stavros might uh, talk about, but uh, I don't know. Anyway, all I can say is that actually this conjecture here really works if you look at the complement of torus knots in S3 
And that's actually related to some work that I have done very recently with my PhD student, William uh, Mistgaard. And there we established uh, for uh, ciphered fiber manifolds that the Utsuki series is resurgent and that the singularity set is a subset of the classical SL2C transcendence values. And that part is on the archive, this part here. So this, this guy came out uh, some four months ago, William, or one? Yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah, William is here, you can talk to him about it. Um, Star Wars just told me I have to uh, finish very quickly. Higher Teichmuller theory could probably also be used if you want to get at the Selberg trace formula via this. I don't think you can cut along pair of pants for the same reasons. What you should do is you should develop a theory where you extract triangles instead of pair of pants. Then you will have corners on the boundaries and this will be kind of an open geometric recursion. We are working on developing this and I would think that we can prove after we've done that that the Selberg trace uh, fits in that scheme and we can see that that would satisfy open geometric recursion and therefore get the same kinds of results on averages and such things. Thank you very much. <laughs>